What if your favorite AI chatbot was trained using content so disturbing it gave workers PTSD? What if the rise of AI had less to do with technology and more to do with manipulation, exploitation, and empire building? Welcome to the world that Karen Howe, an MIT-trained engineer turned investigative journalist, exposes in this jaw-dropping conversation with Aaron Bastani on the Novara Media Podcast. This is not your average AI chat. It is a deep dive into the hidden truth behind the clean interfaces and smiling tech CEOs. In this video, we unpack 10 powerful takeaways from the conversation that will make you rethink everything you thought you knew about AI. Ready? Here we go. Takeaway one, the disturbing truth about training data. Behind ChatGPT's smooth answers lies a harsh reality. Karen Howe revealed that OpenAI used workers in Kenya to sift through some of the most violent, hateful, and sexually explicit content on the internet. These workers were paid only a few dollars an hour to label whether the content was hate speech, child sexual abuse, or violent threats. Some of the content was not even real, but created by the AI itself to explore its worst possible outputs. The workers had to read and classify it anyway. One man, Mofat, worked on the sexual content team. The job changed him completely. He became distant from his family, stopped talking to his wife, and avoided his stepdaughter. Eventually, his family left him. These workers were not given real mental health support. Their trauma made OpenAI's chatbot safer for the rest of us, but at a hidden human cost. And this is only the beginning. Takeaway two, OpenAI's mission was never stable. OpenAI began in 2015 as a nonprofit, promising to make AI safe and open for everyone. They even said that if another group made faster progress, they would step aside and help them. But that idealistic dream fell apart fast. When the team realized that building powerful AI models would require massive amounts of money and computer power, they decided to become a for-profit company. Elon Musk and Sam Altman clashed over who would lead the new company. Altman won by persuading others that he would be more responsible. Soon, OpenAI stopped releasing its research openly. The name OpenAI became a contradiction. It started chasing investor money while keeping the technology locked away. The company's original promises were sacrificed for power and growth. That brings us to the man at the center of it all. Takeaway three, the real story of Sam Altman. Sam Altman is often described as a visionary, but Karen Howe paints a different picture. He is not just smart, he is deeply strategic. Altman made his name as the president of Y Combinator, Silicon Valley's top startup incubator. There, he built a vast network of investors, founders, and politicians. He was not known for building companies, but for backing them. When OpenAI took off, he stepped in as CEO. Many people who worked closely with him told Karen they could never really tell what he believed. He would always say what others wanted to hear. Some said he was a master manipulator. Paul Graham, his mentor, once said you could drop Altman on an island of cannibals, and he would come back their king. Altman's greatest skill is making people believe in his vision, even if that vision shifts constantly. That vision, as we now know, extends far beyond California. Takeaway four, big tech sees the world like an empire. AI companies today do not just want users, they want resources. Karen Howe says they look at the world the same way old colonial empires did. They search for land, water, and cheap labor wherever they can find it. In one example, an OpenAI employee said, we're running out of land and water, as if they were playing a board game, not dealing with real communities. These companies build data centers in poor or rural areas because they can buy cheap land and face less pushback. Many of these places do not have enough water for their own residents, yet data centers use enormous amounts of it to cool the machines. This is not just about the global South. It is happening in the United States and the United Kingdom too. Empire has simply gone digital, and these empires are thirsty. Takeaway five, AI companies are addicted to power. Training AI models like ChatGPT uses an incredible amount of energy and water. Karen Howe reports that global data centers now account for more than 3% of carbon emissions, and that number is rising fast. Sam Altman even told the US Senate that AI will likely need natural gas, the cleanest of the dirty fuels. But in practice, some companies use much worse. Elon Musk's XAI data center in Memphis is powered by unlicensed methane gas turbines that spew toxic air into nearby neighborhoods. 
AI also needs clean water to cool its systems, and companies often tap into public drinking supplies. In Uruguay, people were drinking toxic water during a drought while Amazon was planning a new data center. In the UK, new housing projects were blocked because there was not enough electricity and water left after data centers took their share. These companies are not just using resources, they are reshaping who gets to access them. So how does all this work? Let's take a step back. We're halfway through the video. Thanks for sticking with us. If you're enjoying it, hit the thumbs up and share it in your WhatsApp groups. If you'd like to support us, please tap the thanks button below. It helps us keep making great content. Drop a comment and don't forget to hit subscribe for more. Now let's continue with the video. Takeaway six, how AI really works today. The word AI is used everywhere, but it does not mean one thing. Karen Howe explains that it is like the word transportation. A bicycle and a rocket are both transportation, but they are not the same. In the same way, A, I can mean anything from a simple spam filter to a powerful chatbot. Today's most advanced AI models use deep learning. That means they learn patterns from huge amounts of data. For example, ChatGPT was trained on books, websites, and conversations to learn how people write. It does not think like a human. It predicts what words are likely to come next. The more data and computing power it gets, the more fluent it sounds. But that fluency can hide how resource-hungry and flawed the system really is. Which leads us to the next problem. Takeaway seven, big AI is wasting energy on bad goals. OpenAI and others believe that scaling up will eventually create artificial general intelligence, or AGI. That means a system that can think and learn like a human. But most serious researchers think that we are not even close. Instead of asking what is useful, companies are chasing bigger models that use more data, more energy, and more chips. Meanwhile, others are showing that smaller models can work just as well. DeepSeek, a Chinese model, matched the performance of American systems using far less compute. Stable Diffusion, another project, made better images using fewer chips. But companies like OpenAI ignored these paths. They are locked into their own method because it gives them a head start, builds investor hype, and keeps competitors out. That ambition is now threatening the foundations of democracy. Takeaway eight, AI companies are eroding democracy. When companies become more powerful than governments, democracy suffers. Karen Howe shows how tech companies are now shaping laws, not following them. In the US, a recent bill backed by big tech would stop states from regulating AI for 10 years. That means these companies could do whatever they want with no rules. In Arizona, local leaders approved a data center without knowing it would consume huge amounts of water. They simply did not have access to independent experts. In the UK, new housing was banned in parts of the M4 corridor because data centers had taken up too much electricity. These decisions are being driven by tech lobbying and sales pitches, not public debate. The result is a quiet takeover of public policy by private ambition. But there is still hope. Takeaway nine, there are ways to push back. All over the world, ordinary people are resisting. In Chile, local water activists stalled an Amazon data center for five years. They forced both the company and the government to negotiate. Now, no new center can be built without community approval. Artists and writers are suing companies that use their work without permission. Teachers and students are demanding a say in how AI is used in schools. Even something as small as rejecting cookie pop-ups on websites is a form of resistance. Karen Howe encourages everyone to get involved. AI systems need land, data, and people to survive. If we control those things, we still have power. And power is the real story here. Takeaway 10. This is about more than technology. The rise of AI is not just about smart machines. It is about who gets to decide the future. A small group of billionaires is building tools that affect billions of lives. They are driven by profit, ideology, and the belief that they know best but they are not gods. These systems are created by people, and people can be wrong. Karen Howe reminds us that we should not be fooled by slick demos or glowing headlines. The technology is not magical. The people behind it are not saints. If we care about fairness, freedom, and the future, we have to ask hard questions and demand better answers. So what will you do with this knowledge? Stay silent or speak up. The truth is out there now. And once you see it, you cannot unsee it. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to support this channel, hit the thanks button below. It really helps us keep going. If you enjoyed this summary, please leave a like and share it in your WhatsApp groups.
To join discussion about this video, drop a comment below. And for more videos like this, hit the subscribe button below.